What will be the nature of the upcoming American dictatorship? This is the single most pressing question of our time, and its answer will shape the future of our country and of the world. Dude, like, oh my god, like, can we talk about, like, the political and economic state of the world right now? President Washington once warned us his descendants upon his farewell address. The alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge natural to party dissension which in different ages and countries has perpetrated the most horrid enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. But this leads at length to a more formal, and permanent despotism. The disorders and miseries which result gradually incline the minds of men to seek security and repose in the absolute power of an individual, and sooner or later, the chief of some prevailing faction, more able or more fortunate than his competitors, turns this despotism to the purpose of his own elevation on the ruins of public liberty. The founders of the United States were well acquainted with the challenges of power. They realized and seriously considered the problems observed by the blunt critics of the common good ethic. They therefore attempted, through the Constitution, to preserve the common good through the intentional separation of power. While arguing for independence, John Adams observes that if Aristotle, Livy, and Harrington knew what a republic was, the British constitution is much more like a republic than an empire. They define a republic to be a government of laws and not of men. Here we see that not only is Adams drawing on the Western tradition of the common good, but also that he deeply believes in a common good vision in which power must not be entrusted to any person to exploit as they wish. This was the central goal and inspiration of the United States Constitution. In Federalist 36, Hamilton muses, Happy it is when the interest which the government has in the preservation of its own power coincides with a proper distribution of public burdens. Jefferson, in his letter to Edward Carrington, cautions his friend to cherish, therefore, the spirit of our people and keep alive their attention. Do not be too severe upon their errors, but reclaim them by enlightening them. If, once they become inattentive to the public affairs, you and I and Congress and assemblies, judges and governors, shall all become wolves. It seems to be the law of our general nature in spite of individual exceptions. The founders and framers of the United States could not agree on much of anything, and yet they shared a unanimous and deep suspicion of tyranny and the concentration of power. But their renunciation of power politics is not so much dismissal as acknowledgement of its validity, and a desire despite this to strive towards a better, if more difficult, ideal. There are so many writings from the founding era observing this that it is hard to even limit them, but I have to use the most famous from Federalist 51, where Madison writes, What is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. While modern critics may scorn. Americans have, at least since World War II, been treated to decades of what can only be rightly called propaganda about why freedom, liberty, and democracy are not simply modes of government, but virtues in and of themselves. There really is nothing modern or even particularly democratic per se in the American constitutional system as President Washington wrote to the same Edward Carrington. It is on great occasions only, and after time has been given for cool and deliberate reflection, that the real voice of the people can be known. Sure, the U.S. is democratic and for good reason, but the real energy and staying power behind the U.S. Constitution is its skepticism of power concentration, and therefore, real separation of powers separation between branches of government, between federal and state, and even separation to the people affording them the right to bear arms, just in case. Contrary to this wisdom, a growing contingent on the right has struck upon a power-based authoritarian notion sometimes called the American Caesar, 
you can catch whiffs of this thinking here and there throughout the online right, as with Nick Fuentes here. And uh, and it sucks, and it is what it is, but that's why we need uh, dictatorship. <laughs> that's unironically why we need to get rid of all that. We need to take control of the media or take control of the government and force the people to believe what we believe or force them to play by our rules and reshape the society. But the best and most centralized case I've seen advocating for this comes from the channel Leather Apron Club. Leather Apron Club is a right-wing political philosophy channel who published a video called How America Will Become a Dictatorship. According to Leather Club, since the U.S. has become so disunified, social breakdown is inevitable, and given this inevitability, dictatorship will come. For the simple fact that the dictator holds all of the power and can get done absolutely anything which needs doing, he can be considered to be the most effective form of government. Conversely, and for the same reasons, a dictator also has the potential to provide the absolute worst quality of government. This makes the office of dictator a sort of last-ditch effort, a terrible tool to be used only in times of extreme crisis, where all alternatives have already proven ineffective. I propose, not lightly so, but the time has come to utilize this most terrible of tools. There are many angles to attack these ideas from. You have to admire Leather Club for his confidence to propose such a radical thing. And to allow the viewer into my own bias on the matter, I consider such thinking as a purely intellectual exercise, something the internet authoritarian right-wingers, they sort of solemnly repeat to each other and then they go on about their normal lives. The idea of an American dictator is no different in my eyes than the idea of American communism. Well, it's less likely, if we're being honest. A, a Twitter communist blathering about how he's going to work in mental health and micro-gardening in the oncoming communist utopia has more hope of his ideas coming to fruition than this. But it's the ideas I want to examine here, not the strategy. If the reasoning is sound, we shouldn't shrink from it based on its political expediency after all. So with that in mind, let's consider the hypothesis of the American dictator laid out so thoroughly and well by Leather Apron Club. The idea of affording emergency state powers to the most efficient decision-making group possible, one man, is far from a new one, of course. The standard example of a state implementing this idea would be Rome, the place from which we get the word dictator. During times of crisis in the Republic, their constitution would be temporarily suspended, and all state power would be vested in the person of the dictator, who could do practically anything he needed to in order to get the job done. This institution created some of the most legendary figures of Roman history, the most famous of whom being Cincinnatus, Sulla, and Julius Caesar all of whom were also beloved in their own time. Proof that the office of dictator is not synonymous with tyrant nor despot. It is true that many of us in America have been so used to the U.S. ideal for so long that we've forgotten that it is not the human default. Comparisons to Rome are overused at best, but Cicero's lament of his own republic fits this situation perfectly in my opinion. Long before our time, the customs of our ancestors molded admirable men, and, in turn, these eminent men upheld the ways and institutions of their forebears. Our age, however, inherited the Republic as if it were some beautiful painting of bygone ages, its colors already faded through great antiquity, and not only has our time neglected to freshen the colors of this picture, but we have failed to preserve its form and outlines. The human default is power politics, and for good reason, it's more in line with our nature. Some circles have confused our system, which is reason building on nature, for nature itself. I share Leather Apron's frustration with this naivete, but we should not take this as automatic license to renounce common good ethics for power politics. Leather Club seems to see open power politics as the forthright antidote to the power politics which is already happening under the toxic mimic of the constitutional common good. He is right to refuse to concede to the illusion. But the reason this toxic mimic exists is because, rather than have skepticism of those who would presume to rule over us as Jefferson recommends, society has changed its view of human nature as a whole, seeming to think that there are some few 
some gifted and wonderful few who are deserving of power and good enough by some grace to wield it over us as a blessing. This is an astounding shift from a national vision of a free people to a nation of subjects. But human nature does not change with the times and neither does the seduction of power. While it is better to be forthright like Leather Club, the choking suffocation of unchecked power is the real root problem, covert or overt. As John Adams puts it very nicely, there is danger from all men. The only maxim of a free government ought to be to trust no man living with power. In any movement through which people seek to acquire power and influence, corruptible human nature will always twist good intentions until they are so contorted nothing really remains but ego. It does not matter what political perspective is represented. Whatever small piece of control a human being can seize, they will in most cases. President Donald Trump unironically hailed by the likes of Nick Fuentes as a potential American dictator of the sort Leather Club hopes for, is not clean from corruption either. It is human nature to sweep the evidence of such corruption under the rug if we politically agree with the perpetrator, but nonetheless. Two billion dollars were awarded to the president's son-in-law and top advisor Jared Kushner from the Saudi royal family shortly after the president left office. And rather than distancing himself from the shady dealing with a foreign interest, President Trump continues to embrace Kushner as a close advisor in his 2024 presidential bid. For those who put their trust in President Trump, that he was going to drain the swamp, they saw him transform into the very swamp creature they had elected him to vanquish. And lest you worry that I have some special animus towards the former president, I personally see no particular difference between this and, say, Hunter Biden's nepotistic involvement with the Ukrainian Burisma or Vice President Cheney's shameful profiteering from his company Halliburton in the Iraq War or Dr. Fauci's laughably obtuse obfuscation regarding the gain-of-function research he funded, or Secretary Austin's self-interested leadership at the Department of Defense, despite having been executive at Raytheon directly before. At a certain point, this is not a party or philosophical issue, it is a power issue. I generally agree with Leather Club's diagnosis of American troubles. But then just look at the state of our country. We have civil strife, which states are either incapable or unwilling to deal with. An increase in crime rate for the first time in decades. Uncontrolled immigration in some 20 plus million illegals, which our current president wants to see made into citizens. This is not to mention the deeper foundational rot of our country, including our banking system, which gives unfettered control of our economy to the elites, where they are free to choose winners and losers in a nepotistic orgy of our money. A military-industrial complex who regularly commits atrocities half a world away in the name of defense. And a state-compliant media who seems inept at informing the public, yet shows great skill in creating division. All of these cracks are reaching ahead. But the way I see it, these have sprung mostly from the concentration of power which allows such corruption to be seen as acceptable or normal. The legislative branch, which was designed to be the most powerful due to its power of the purse, has renounced its civic duty to craft policy to the unelected and unaccountable executive bureaucracy and the also unelected judiciary, as Patrick Henry predicted. It is easy to see why. Without having to put their votes on record or make meaningful decisions, they dramatically lower the risk the people they represent might become unsatisfied. It also frees them to do more important work, like publishing insightful autobiographies, making media appearances, enriching the Twitter discourse, and of course, playing the stock market. <laughs> they have relinquished power because with it comes responsibility and in a democratic branch, accountability. And they'd rather not risk it, so they have given it to a people who have nobody to be accountable to. This self-neutering has come at the cost of holding the executive bureaucracy and judiciary accountable. Have a toothless show hearing and have done with it. The point, though, is that what America suffers from is a toxic concentration of power not the balance that was intended. And rather than advocate for a restoration of this balance, Leather Club advocates for more imbalance. 
To be clear, the Constitution would be suspended, and absolute executive power would be placed in the hands of one man. But it would only be done in order to save the Constitution. This is like trying to cure lung cancer through cigarettes. It is the power that is the problem, not the solution. They say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is a very charitable notion. Anybody who has seen an old lady in charge of a local church hymnal committee will know that it doesn't take that much. Most of us are corruptible over far less than this, but institutional, lawful, government-enforced power? We can't ignore the risks we would take or the depths to which we would stoop. Not them, by the way. Not some other person, but us, ourselves, would stoop in order to achieve and exert it. Justice Clarence Thomas gives us a good gut check on this, in my opinion. Our view of the task to be undertaken and the goal to be attained is magnified and ambitious, far beyond the better at the door and more modest personal challenges. Somehow, we find it more comfortable and safer to tackle someone else's problems rather than our own, and we are more at ease discussing the larger cultural problems that we are less capable of solving directly than we are at finding what we can do on a daily basis to make a difference. It is much easier to get worked up about others and the seemingly intractable universal problems than it is to get worked up about ourselves. We fret and complain about the extent of the problem and feeling helpless suggests that there is nothing we can personally do to restore the culture. We retire to insular compounds of our private lives, mumbling to ourselves and preaching to the choir. In the end, no matter how momentarily relieved we are to sound the alarm, we have this discomforting sense that it will ultimately be by our example, not our criticism that we will change hearts and minds. We cannot ever be free of the risk of power, only try our best to have self-awareness and harness it productively. This is the iron rule, the overwhelming rule to which neither I nor you nor anyone else is exempt. Nobody blinded by egoism thinks that they are only trying to glorify themselves. Nonetheless, they are. We can't expect any honesty from them. As Aesop says, the tyrant will always find a pretext for his tyranny. Even in our current enlightened age, our natures are still corruptible. Even if we say everything right to the public, like President Trump promising to drain the swamp, our natures are still corruptible. It would be convenient for those who presume to lead others and to assert their will that they were born in the exact right time for their authority to be noble. Nevertheless, they are serving themselves, their ego. They are hoping for greater power towards their individual good. They are bequeathing themselves with the power to rule. But is this a principle of good governance? Or is it, as Justice Thomas suggests, an expression of the will to dominate the other and to glorify the self without having to confront the more available but ultimately more difficult means of improvement. Is Fuentes or Leather Club so strong to resist the evils of power? Is anyone? The limitation and separation of powers is to protect us from the other, but it also serves us as a check against ourselves. Solzhenitsyn reminds us also that the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every man and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. Leather Club's optimism about handling power leads him to dismiss the most fundamental strength of our constitution, power transferal. A temporary nullification of all branches of government, save for one man in the executive. Recognizing that power tends to beget more power over time, they simply limited the time for which dictators could wield power. Another means of limiting a dictator's power, one not implemented in Rome, is to bestow the ability for some group, a senate or judges for example, to strip the dictator of his power were he no longer fulfilling his mandate in their eyes. This type of dictator, first defined by Carl Schmitt, would be called a commissary dictator. There would then only exist three methods by which the dictator could lose his power. First and foremost would be the possibility of removal by some set of judges, perhaps actual legal judges on the Supreme Court, who could remove the dictator if they determined that he was no longer serving his mandate, no longer protecting the Constitution. Secondly, he would be stripped of his power if his given time as dictator elapsed. And lastly, of course, he could relinquish power himself before his given time had elapsed. 
transference of power is a hell of a thing to yada yada like he does here. The majority of the wars in human history were fought over just this subject. If you're serious about peaceful transference of power, you need to rely on more diffusion than just some limp-wristed committee. When comparing our constitution to the Soviet constitutions, Justice Anston and Scalia said of them, they were not worth the paper they were printed on, as are the human rights guarantees of a large number of still extant countries governed by presidents for life. They are what the framers of the Constitution called parchment guarantees because the real constitutions of those countries, the provisions that establish the institutions of the government, do not prevent centralization of power in one man or one party, thus enabling the guarantees to be ignored. Structure is everything. I get that the U.S. Constitution is kind of like the Bible. Everybody feels like they kind of know it enough already, and they've all sort of heard it. There are some people who think it's garbage, some people who are devoted to it. Many more people just don't really care that much. Leather Club's attitude towards democracy is lukewarm, and I think any reasonable person should at least consider, if not concede, his arguments around its weakness. But I think he has failed to perceive the true form and outlines of our Constitution. There is an undeniable purpose to the document, to ensure that no faction, whether through express autocracy or through majoritarian oppression, can use their power to dominate others through the government. This limitation of power politics is oriented perhaps not towards the good of your favored faction, but towards the common good in which you are included and which, hopefully, you can at least begrudgingly assent to. But if you don't want to make peace with your time, contemporaries, and culture, you can always retreat to the comfort of a niche ideology. Solzhenitsyn, again, famously said, ideology, that is what gives evil doing its long-sought justification and gives the evildoer the necessary steadfastness and determination. In the face of power, no man is immune to such evil doing. Humans have the potential for such great viciousness, and when allowed through our ideology to set that potential free, we cause greater destruction than we ever thought possible. That's the common wisdom here in America, at least. But Leather Club does not hold the sensibilities of your average bubba in very high regard. There will always be those who oppose dictatorship by leaning on such tired old battle cries, especially from the older baby boomer contingent. They will revel in their hollow slogans of, freedom isn't free, or don't tread on me. They'll feel so wise when they cite Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here. He scoffs at the Americans' love of our mores as propaganda. He seems to think, and I guess this is how he learned it, that democracy is all our system stands for. If he actually believed in Jared Taylor's veneration of our original system, though, he would understand that it stands for far more liberty, democracy, equality under the law, individual agency, these are parts of our cultural ethos which I think most Americans are right to venerate if only because they are ours. But as we've explored, these exist as a supplement to the true innovation of our constitution, the central American value, our disgust with tyrants. This is the core of our national veneration of President Washington of whom Napoleon the tyrant ruefully scoffed. They wanted me to be another Washington. Napoleon judged the power politics is better. Washington, the renunciation of power is better. Napoleon considered, therefore, President Washington to be somewhat of a naive yokel, it seems. A bubba, perhaps. Classic French. <laughs> but... I doubt our first president was naive. In fact, stepping down freely from power was a fully aware renunciation of the Napoleonic grandiosity. He knew of the potential and renounced it. It would at least be a recommendation to the proposed constitution that it is provided with more checks and barriers against the introduction of tyranny and those of a nature less liable to be surmounted than any government hitherto instituted among mortals hath possessed. It would have saddened President Washington to see the state of the country today. But the response to the dynamic he tragically predicted is not to renounce him, but to re-embrace him. 
In Leather Club's description, he says, Many of us believe the current state of the U.S. to be untenable, yet are hesitant to, to suggest solutions. Here is one which, although it may offend our sensibilities, offers a real chance at alleviating the current social, economic, and political disputes we are currently experiencing in the U.S. Well, <laughs> considered my pearls duly clutched. <laughs> But what I see here is a very normal phenomenon. Fervent political movements in the delusion of their isolation become solipsistic in their political goals and unwilling to meet the average human in their society where they so happen to be at. It becomes inconceivable to them that the dreaded normie might be in touch, even if through unconscious cultural mores, with something deeper or more legitimate than they are in any way. The mores of our society, loved for their unique and special beauty, can therefore be casually waved away as propaganda. And that fear of such a governmental office is nothing more than a cowardly submission to the modern propaganda which touts democracy as absolute possible. Any who seek to undermine the idea of temporary autocratic rule by pointing out this supposed irony should be ignored. This is disrespectful and jarring, you would think he'd be trying to persuade the normals, not disparage them, but it's also inaccurate in this case. Again, almost as though he's never even really thought it worth the trouble to try and understand the political foundation of the United States that deeply. This breezy belittling of one's own country is bemoaned by G.K. Chesterton. The people who live in a country do not know much about it. It is not that they are ignorant, but that they are familiar. They have got used to the sun and do not see the sunrise. Ironically, what Leather Apron Club advocates for is really the human standard for handling power, not just historically, but globally today. He's just so used to the stability, he no longer appreciates how extraordinary it is. I have a Syrian friend who is absolutely convinced that the incredible stability of the United States must be due <laughs> must be due to a Jewish conspiracy. He can't imagine any other way wherein political power would be given up willingly. And my friend knows from tragic personal experience, factions seeking their advantage at all costs is the human norm. People seeking power at all costs is the human norm. They will give themselves any excuse to attain it, wield it, especially if they can cloak their ambitions in the virtue of an ideology. What my Syrian friend fails to appreciate about the U.S. is that power is not given up willingly. Power is forced out by structural design, as Justice Scalia noted, through the balance of powers. It is a feat of political engineering that the United States Constitution is able to keep its stability, causing wonder across the globe. Actual disbelief in some cases, like that of my friend. It is not the longest standing written constitution on the globe by accident. The only nod Leather Club gives to the balance of power, the central operative principle of the constitution, is nothing but a parchment guarantee, even his assertion that If the citizens of the U.S. are interested in maintaining our current system of law and defending the U.S. Constitution, then the only solution to the modern social crisis is the appointment of a commissary dictator as described above. Someone who rules at the whim of some other ultimate wielder of sovereignty. A commissary dictatorship, which is appointed by officials in the government to defend the U.S. Constitution, is the preferable option. He may as well have said that the engine should be removed from a car, but only in order to help it move forward. <laughs> to be clear, Leather Club isn't wrong because what he says is transgressive. Our country was founded on men bold enough to be transgressive. He isn't wrong because what he says is outside the mainstream acceptable opinion. American popular opinion dictates neither truth nor reality. And honestly, it's kind of fun to be transgressive, provided you don't therefore envision yourself as in possession of some Manichaean occult knowledge. <laughs> That's what most ideologues love. But personally, I'm with Russell Kirk on this one. By definition, ideology means servitude to political dogmas, abstract ideas not founded upon historical experience. If Leather Club cared at all 
for the historical experience or culture of this country, he wouldn't be so quick to jump to dictatorship, which, while I agree is not necessarily wrong in the abstract, is plainly wrong for us. In politics, better solutions tend to be those which are closer to the already existing mores of a country, those which require the least amount of change. Politics doesn't have to do only with abstract ideas, it has to do with societies, people, circumstances, and cultures. In this sense, radicalism is not judged on some absolute global moral scale, but on its relation to the prevailing culture of the country in question. Globally speaking, dictatorship is quite moderate, but for us in America, it is so far removed from the average person, the historical culture, and even the fundamental operative principles of our very government, it is radical. This is bad because the contempt for the country and lack of understanding from which it typically springs, especially jarring from somebody born and bred here. And it doesn't work to impose a government, not of the nature the culture is willing to accept, but also because it is detached from the political reality that in order to win, you have to build a coalition, which means it has to be as basic, broad, and inclusive as possible. Horrible, I know for the ideologue to accept. And while Leather Club can sneer at this sensibility, Americans just hate dictators. It goes back to our founding, but even before that, Englishmen hadn't been governed by an absolute executive in hundreds of years. In his History of the English-Speaking Peoples, Winston Churchill observes of the English, in place of the king's arbitrary despotism, they propose not the withering anarchy of feudal separatism, but a separation of checks and balances which would accord the monarchy its necessary strength, but would prevent its perversion by a tyrant or a fool. What Leather Club is suggesting here is a break from our social norms, deeper than he appreciates, I think. Let Schmidt preach about his commissary dictator to the continental Europeans. They have heritage plausibly consistent with this form of government at least. Without making a value judgment right or wrong, we can at least say unsuitable for us. As a quick caveat, the new right tends to play on a human need ignored by other systems, especially left and liberal, which is hold your head up high, be proud, you come from a great people, carry it on to your own children, and by the way, if we were to talk about human rights, I think this is one of the closest candidates to be respected. But here in America, when we tell our sons to hold their heads up high, hatred of tyranny is part of that, part of our whole cultural heritage, part of our reason to be proud. The idea of the American Caesar, popular in some cultures on the right, when stripped down to its essential argument, is that the good of the faction is synonymous with the good of the country, the power, Leather Club, and others think, should rest with the new American Caesar. Any balance given to others is only a concession to the Schmidian enemy. Such majoritarian talk is the exact reason why the balance of powers is so desperately needed. Today, more than ever before, we ought to seek restoration to hold power accountable, not revolution to adopt it.